Penums and the Monobactam um, as trio name. The genetic material for carbapenemase, the enzyme, is able to move between genetic elements and to different genus and species of organisms, and that is what is really terrible. So not only is it our last line of defense that we have for this family of organisms, but it's also able to spread to other families and uh, types of organisms. So uh, if a patient has an infection with a member of the Enterobacteriaceae family, uh, their therapy changes depending on what type of infection it is. So if there is an intestinal infection, um, most likely the doctor is going to order rehydration. Um, antibiotics can be used uh, if the physician wants to shorten the duration of the infection or the excretion of the organism, but that's really only done when the infection is really severe and it honestly gives the, um, it provides the risk for the bacteria to create resistance or um, have resistance to the antibiotics used. So it's not really um, the best choice in the long run. Uh, UTI therapy, uh, urinary tract infections, they're usually uh, just treated with one antibiotic and then the patient, you know, completes the antibiotic course and uh, usually they get better. Other body sites, the therapy can include different uh, drug combinations uh, where systemic infections would include a potent beta-lactam drug with an aminoglycoside. So it's important for the physicians and the laboratory to keep up with the current CLSI breakpoint updates so that we know the best therapy for these patients and don't um, promote resistance of the bacteria. So the patients are also part of that team and they should complete their antibiotic courses as stated in their prescriptions and consult their physician if they have any questions. So we just um, threw out the word beta-lactamase, and I want to make sure to explain that a little bit. So a beta-lactamase is an enzyme that's naturally produced by bacteria, and it hydrolyzes the beta-lactam drug um, by breaking up. There's a little... Um, there's a little ring that has nitrogen at one point on it, and the uh, beta-lactamase is able to go in and break up that ring so it's no longer effective against the bacteria's um, PBP, which means <clears throat> penicillin binding proteins. And those are located um, on the peptidoglycan and they are enzymes that maintain the peptidoglycan. So uh, these, um, the beta-lactam drugs, they go and they try to bind to this PBP protein um, that is present in uh, both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The gram-positive um, are less, well, that depends on a lot, so I can't really say that. Um, but the gram positives aren't really seen too much as a um, problem with resistance to this bacteria um, or because they secrete their PBP, or, sorry, their beta-lactamase into the environment around them, whereas the, uh, the enzyme beta-lactamase that's naturally produced by the bacteria of gram-negative, they are in the periplasmic, periplasmic space in the cell wall, and that increases the protection of that organism because it can basically go and block the uh, PBP from binding. So the drug, the drug will come into the cell wall and here's the beta-lactam, <clears throat> beta-lactamase enzyme, and it comes and it binds to the drug, and this is going to be fun, it rips it apart, it hydrolyzes it so that it's no longer effective. Remember we talked about it breaking that ring open? So that was fun.
So we see more of a rising increase in the resistance of the gram negatives, basically the gram negative rods, to the beta lactam drugs because they have that internal holding on of their beta lactamase enzyme. So the resistant mechanism. Uh, I'm sorry, the genes uh, to the enzymes, uh, the beta-lactamase enzymes are on their plas the bacteria's plasmids, transposons within an integron or in the bacteria's chromosome. So it's in the genetic material of the organism. And the mechanism of resistance could include a genetic, a genetic mutation that changes the structure of that PBP so that the uh, pretend this is whole again, <laughs> so that that drug can go and actually bind to the PBP and then um, make it so that the cell wall can no longer be maintained or created or um, if it was damaged to replace the peptidoglycan so then the uh, bacteria will die. <clears throat> there also might be genetic recombination making the PBP structure itself resistant to the binding of the beta-lactam drug. So this no longer is able to bind. Um, overproduction of normal PBPs, and again, this is penicillin binding proteins in the uh, cell wall of the organism, the bacteria itself. So overproduction of normal uh, PBPs is going to result in the drug not being able to bind to them at all, <clears throat> um, or it would be less, <clears throat> excuse me, less uh, effectiveness because there are a lot of PBPs, so anyone that binds is not really going to make a difference because there's so many. And then gaining genetic material from other bacteria that's going to lower the PBP's affinity to the beta-lactam drug. So when we say lower affinity, that means that this PBP no longer wants to bind to this drug anymore. Okay, so <clears throat> treatment of organisms that become susceptible, to, or sorry, to become resistant to beta-lactam drugs is to use a combination um, of drugs to make it so that the drug actually works and does um, kill the bacteria. So what you would have is a pairing of a beta-lactam drug that has antimicrobial anti, sorry, activity, and that could be including ampicillin, amoxicillin, you've probably heard these before, um, and that's going to be paired with a beta-lactam that doesn't really have any antimicrobial activity at all. Um, and the reason for that is so that the one that doesn't have the antimicrobial activity is going to block. This is going to be great. It's going to block the beta-lactamase that the bacteria is producing so that that beta-lactamase cannot come up and bind the drug and destroy it. Instead, there's a little fight going on over here and the beta-lactam drug is then able to bind to that PVP and then we have destruction of the bacteria. Dun, dun, dun. But <laughs> as we talked about before, there is the possibility that we have a, um, a bacteria that is changing so that it has uh, resistant to more beta-lactam drugs, and um, we want to make sure that we figure that out. So the next piece of this is we want to talk about how do you figure out extended spectrum beta-lactamase. So that just means that those enzymes that are produced by the bacteria that are called beta-lactamases, um, they make uh, the organism resistant to most beta-lactam drugs. And that ends up being more and more of a problem as we try to make different generations of the drug and they're becoming less and less effective because the bacteria are catching on to us. So what we want to do is we wanna figure out, um, number one, if we need to test the organism for that or not. So if, if we found out that an organism on here was showing uh, resistance uh, to whatever 
drug that it was uh, we wanted to use or we're just picking out uh, drugs that we could possibly use and we see one that's uh, supremely resistant like one of these if we were s suspecting that this was an ESBL or an extended spectrum beta lactamase um, <clears throat> producing organism we could end up doing a test to figure that out so there are three different options that you can do with the synergistic effect and there's the double disc method there's the combination disc method and there's the E disc method I'm just gonna talk about the double disc method. Um, so this is, uh, this is a Mueller-Hinton plate that was inoculated the same way, except we have a different number of um, drug discs on here now. We also have the, um, we also have the blank, so this is making sure that um, we notice there isn't any contamination. We look for that again here. We notice there is a normal, full, consistent line of growth. There is no little guy um, showing contamination and or excessive growth of some other organism on there. So what we would do is a cephalosporin and a cl clavinate combination of discs on here. So we would do um, one disc. This has three discs. I'm only going to talk about a two disc one. We would do one disc that has um, just the cephalosporin that we're interested in finding whether there's a beta lactamase to um, and one disc that actually has the clavel clavinate and the antibiotic in it. Okay. So say that these were those two. Okay, say this was the cephalosporin we were trying to figure out um, if the, uh, or that would indicate rather the ESBL. Um, we saw it was resistant to it before on the other plate. Um, and then we added the cephalosporin one and then the one with cephalosporin and the clavity in there. And we would then uh, incubate it just like we did the other time that we just talked about and when we pull it out and we measure if we see a five millimeter uh, growth of zone of inhibition then we can presume um, that it is an ESBL so if we see a five millimeter growth increase in the one that has both the clavinate and the um, the cephalosporin in it over just the cephalosporin itself, that would indicate ESBL or extended, beta, extended spectrum beta lactamase. <clears throat> there could also be a distortion in the zones of no growth, like a keyhole shape, and I'm going to draw that on here. So if there was, oh, that's not working. Sorry, hold on. Okay, if there was a zone here and there was a distortion like this, this is a keyhole, okay? And um, that would show extended spectrum beta lactamase as well. So basically what you're seeing here is that you would have um, the synergistic effect would help to uh, treat the bacteria so that it would die um, and not be resistant it would be susceptible to that combination so like we had talked about before having uh, a dose of two beta lactams together to one binds the beta lactam sorry beta lactamase enzyme where and blocks it so that the beta lactam drug can then bind to the PBP in the the bacteria cell wall. So let's go ahead and just act like this is a um, a situation and see if we what we come up with. Okay, so here we have basically a twenty <clears throat> five or six. There's a little bit of a. Uh, a little indent of growth right there. So I'm going to say a 25 millimeter um, uh, measurement over here. And let's look at this one. So this one has a 
a haze um, here and a haze of growth is not considered relevant in swarming protea species around sulfonamides or around trimethoprim only. Um, let's act like this is uh, one of those times, even though this is a coli, we're going to act like that is, this is one of those times because I want to make it so it is, <laughs> it is effective. So this one, well, maybe, um, this one is a, we'll say 34, um, for sake of, for the sake of this video, since you're seeing what I'm doing, uh, we'll just, we'll, we will go with what it should be. So it's like 35 here, 34, that is above five millimeters. Um, if this was, um, if the haze was something that we should worry about, then it would basically be, oh, let's go in further. So it would basically be 20, seven and the previous one was a 25 so that this would not in, indicate beta lactamase if we did um, count that the haze was an issue um, because it was something outside of proteus which it is so in this case we're not seeing a <clears throat> excuse me we're not seeing an ESBL, but had it been a protea species where we didn't count the haze, then it would <clears throat> it would have been uh, it would have been an ESBL. Well, I hope that has been very helpful to you, and I will see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you for watching. Bye.